Hi, I'm Dr. Heather Tillewine, and I'm here with Claire Kilman, who is a conversion therapy survivor. So Claire, tell us a little bit about yourself. My name is Claire Kilman. I am the former Midwest Regional Director of Conversion Therapy Dropout Network. I survived conversion therapy when I was 14 years old, and now I use my time and energy to help other survivors just like me. Claire, tell me about when you first identified as being transgender. So I understood that I was different when I was cognizant of gender, right? I, I would say that when I became aware that there was gendered interrelation between human beings, I understood in and of myself womanhood, or at least I did an identification with womanhood, you know? Um, and I would say I started to develop that framework of consciousness around four or five. Just when you start picking up different cues of social interactions, when you start understanding that there's like a mom and a dad and that um, you know women and men occupy certain so sociological functions um, in a society, I felt deeply compelled um, to identify, not, not just to identify with one more than the other, but that when I was assigned certain sociological roles and functions, that there was this internal repulsion from that. And so I would say, you know, very early, that I, under I understood at least that something was wrong um, or different. And by the time I was a teenager, I had the language to be able to sort of crystallize exactly what that meant, right, as far as being transgender. So when you first started identifying as a teenager as transgender, did you ever come out to your parents? I would not phrase it that way. Um, I didn't have the opportunity to come out to my parents. I was outed um, by my community to my parents. So how were you outed? What happened? It's complicated. Um, well, I had a number of experiences in my early teens that, you know, led to me embarking on this journey of sort of self-discovery, right, and self-actualization, really. And, you know, people talk. I come from a really, really small town in southern Missouri. My parents are relatively well-known there. They sit at the sort of, you know, within, within the top part of a framework of hierarchy. And so they had people that would go back to them and report on, you know, the fact that I would change clothes once I got to school that I, um, you know, was having sex in my early teens. Those sorts of things just made their way back to my parents. And it's interesting how it all sort of shook out. Um, I came out about something that happened to me early on. It was a compromising where I wound up being sexually molested by a cousin at an early age, the fall of 2009, um, it was sort of eating me up. Maybe not though, I think it more confused me as I reflected on it, because I was coming into this deeper understanding of myself and when I thought about it, what had happened to me, I think I was just confused, you know, more confused. And when I sought help, I disclosed my gender and sexuality to a school counselor, right? Um, as, as I disclosed all the rest of this, but they reported my molestation to my parents. And so it completely and totally fractured my family. Um, we had separate holidays. Um, you know, people in my family blamed me, um, but only after they found out that I was transgender and that I liked men. And they found out that December they were informed through their own networks, um, not, not a month later. So we had like a separate Thanksgiving where my cousin's family had like a totally separate Thanksgiving from, from ours and there was like a bit of social fracturing to them finding out, me getting put in conversion therapy and then that winter, everyone coming back together and me somehow being the villain, right? Yeah. Within the, the framework of my family, the, the the interrelating dynamic of my family, I was somehow 
the the outcast and they were like embracing my cousin and well your parents were very religious right oh deeply yeah. so you know i come from a super fundamentalist background my father was deaconized in our church i got baptized at the age of nine i think was when i was baptized in the baptist church my mother is the chief financial officer of our denomination and so i just grew up going to church three times a week every week you know after i was outed a lot of things happened but one of them was that i was put in a private baptist academy pulled out of public schooling so that way i could be further distance from friends who they thought were pulling me away from God. You know, conversion therapy, pastoral counseling came first, but then conversion therapy came after, where, you know, they thought God was the answer or that the institutions that, that God had allowed them to build and shape in my hometown held the answers and they sought them out. And I would say their motivations were not entirely pure to that end where like they professed a certain sort of faith. You know, they were concerned for my immortal soul. So they told me. However, I think what was really at stake for them and why conversion therapy was so important to them as an option was because they got to show their community that they were doing everything they possibly could to make sure I wasn't going to be who I knew I was. And so it was a vanity project, in a way. So what happened on that night where you actually, your parents took you to the conversion therapist? Do you like remember how you got there? The night they found out was super rough, right? Let's start there. When they found out that I was the way that I was, all hell sort of broke loose. Um, I thought my father was gonna kill me. And I mean, he threatened to do it, you know? I got, beaten. I mean, that was a given. Are they forced me to stay up late into, and this happened frequently, they forced me to stay up late reading Bible verses about how it was an abomination. You know, there were all, just preemptively before we even get to conversion therapy, right? There are all sorts of different like avenues that they're taking that are laying the foundations for the abuse that comes later, right? Now, did they start doing that because they were given that advice from kind of a church member or was that on their own? That was, this is just on their own, right? Like on their own, they're blaming me for marital problems based on Bible verses, right? And I mean, I'm sure they got these Bible verses referred to them from somewhere. They're just yeah. interpreting them in their own way. They feel like they have the moral authority. And it, at this point, it's everything that I can do in my 14 year old brain to keep up with them philosophically because I'm being asked to justify, right? Who and what I am to them on, upon some moral basis that I have no ability to do. But like, you know, I, I am suddenly seen in this moment as a poison to my community at large, to my family, um, to my church, to my faith. Um, and from that moment on, it was like my entire community turned its back on me, unless I was, you know, following conversion therapy to the letter, which I was held against my will, you know? That was the eventual outcome. Like, it was, we're going to kill you or you're going to conversion therapy. Pretty much that felt, you know? That night, my dad ripped me out of my bed, chucked me out into the snow, because it was December and snow was falling. I had not a stitch of clothes on, and I was forced to stay out there. And by the time they let me back in, in the morning, they said, you're going to, you're going to conversion therapy. And then it pretty much immediately started, you know? I mean, it's like within the next week, I went to, to go see Jim Venice. That's his name. I got led into some dark church basement where he practiced conversion therapy out of. And you didn't know him prior to this? Oh no, you know, I had no idea who this person was. Did um, your parents, how did they meet him? Through, they were referred through the church. Now this is what they got referred to through our church. They, um, you know, after I was given pastoral counseling, I'm sure that this was a recommendation made. And then, so when you went to this pastor's church, what happened in the basement? Well, you know, we were driving there. One, it was exhausting. I mean, the whole ordeal was crippling. Um, like I would have to drive or be driven 
four hours up there and four hours back. So it's eight o'clock by the time you get there. You're led into a dark church basement, psychologically tortured, four hours, and then you drive back home. And it's maybe four in the morning, five in the morning. Have you ever left there or? No, my parents were, one of them was always either outside of the room, in their car, or in the session with me. And were they ever included in any of the sessions? Oh yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. My parents were definitely present in the sessions, both of them. And sometimes just one, but oftentimes both. And so what happened during the sessions? I would be shown pretty graphic images of you know, the dangers of the LGBT lifestyle, sexually transmitted diseases, um, drug use, just really horrific stuff. Um, you know, I, my behavior would be modified. I'd be taught to, forced to sit or speak or act a certain way. Um, my gesticulations were sort of modified, um, my head was shaved, and self-expression was sort of curtailed. My parents were blamed for everything. Jim Venice used something called the cut method. Each of these conversion therapists uses something different, you know, some quack method to administer. They have no psychological background, no training, no certification. They're not part of any association or anything that regulates their practices because it's religious based. And so the methodology he employed was that we've all got a cup, right, in us. And if there's certain divinely ordained things a cup must be filled with. And on my cup, my cup was filled with the wrong things. And so what needed to happen was things needed to be removed from my cup and the right things needed to be put back in. And so it was this dualistic process of calling out every fiber of expression of myself, right? To, to tease out and eradicate every single scrap of the dearly held me that I knew was in there and to try to replace that with something entirely foreign. Um, and you know, you're gaslit. You're told that there is a deity that loves you unconditionally. Um, and then, I don't know, every condition under the sun is placed on you. So when he's doing like these behavior modifications and everything, did you just automatically accept them or did you ever combat any of this? And how was that met by your parents? I mean, I'm a combative person by nature. So <laughs> I definitely gave everyone a lot of pushback, you know, where like I would be asked, well, it's torture, you know, it's like it's torture. You're being tortured. And so you can fight back. But for how long? Mm -hmm. You know, you can resist people trying to, so I mean, there's, there's a problem there. It's like, how, how do you um, sustain fighting back from someone psychologically and physically torturing you, from mentally torturing you? Um, at a certain point, you repress, you know? Because their funda their fun the fundamental basis that they're operating on is fallacious. You can't actually remove this from someone. It can't actually be taken from them. The only recourse is to repress, you know? And so I would say that at a certain point, it's like I had no other alternative, you know? I was being threatened by my parents. I was being ostracized by my community. I was being tortured. So you just sort of go along with it after a while in order to get it to stop. And so since you were repressing all of this, how, like, what was the outcome? Eventually, it was the appeasement of Jim Venice. Such, well, he gave my parents the tools to continue torturing me on for years. So, I mean, that was essentially the outcome, was that the tactics that he taught them, they continued to employ, just to make sure I towed the line. And 
you know, eventually I would not, you know? I mean, I don't think I ever really did. I maybe did to them, to their faces, in order to get them to stop. But, you know, I was still myself in secret behind closed doors when they weren't around. How long were you going through conversion therapy? I would term it as three years, you know? I mean, I went to up, to, up in the St. Louis area with Pure Heart Ministries for months. After that, I would still consider that conversion therapy. Just the active attempt to modify or change someone's sexual orientation or gender identity, um, that's conversion therapy. And I would say I lived in what could be described as like a community of conversion therapists. And so did it stop because you moved away from your family or how did conversion therapy end for you? I ran as fast as I could. There was this one night where, you know, another long night of being forced to stay up and endure abuse and, you know, be told how much you're an abomination in the eyes of God, that I locked myself in a bathroom and cried on a floor. Um, you know, really deeply reflecting on what to do, you know, because I felt so trapped, so alone, so isolated, so unlovable, you know. And I made a pact with myself to get as far away from that situation as I possibly could. And so I hatched a sort of plan to graduate a year early, go to cosmetology school, use that as the stepping stone to get into the fashion styling program at SIU, and eventually across the river, sort of plan that out pretty early. Um, that worked, thank God. And I am in a state now that has legal protections and recourse for people like me. So what has been the impact of undergoing conversion therapy? Like how has it impacted your emotional health, your mental health? Severely, you know, it's been a serious detriment. Um, at times I'll get very depressed. Um, you know, I used to, I still feel like, you know, my family and I are estranged. And we don't have a family really. Um, I have a very hard time trusting people, anyone, and getting close. I don't really let people get too close because I've seen what can happen when they do. I don't trust love just because I know what people who say they love you can do when you let them in. Um, I'm definitely harder emotionally uh, than I would like to be, for sure. And at times I feel like I can't trust anyone still and it'll feel just like I'm back there in conversion therapy, that somehow my life, it's so dissociative, but somehow my life is just one big conversion therapy event, you know, and that I'm constantly living in a world that's trying to make me change. And the pressure of that is immense. I mean, it's breaking, you know, to my psychology sometimes, where I'll feel like a crazy person just because, or, I'll feel like I'm off the rails. It's definitely, you know, in the past led to me engaging in riskier behavior to cope. Um, it's tough. I see a psychologist once a week now though, and we're working on it. So you did mention living in a state where that has protections against conversion therapy. I think there's about 20 states that actually protect minors. What do you think could be done to curb or stop conversion therapy from happening to other individuals? I think it needs to be banned at the federal level. And it needs to be banned f beyond the scope of what current bans provide, which is simply punitive action against people who are licensed professionals. Unfortunately, the majority of conversion therapy cases are being administered to, or, you know, by religious officials. They're being administered by religious officials to minors who have no say. What we need is a federal ban. It needs to be considered consumer fraud, and the practice should just be outlawed.
And with it being so underground, because people that are going through conversion therapy often don't remember nor know where they're going, where they got dropped off at, names of people that did the conversion therapy. So what can we do to help like conversion therapy survivors more? One thing that you can do is, uh, you know, if, if you know that there is someone that's about to send their children to conversion therapy, please understand that it is bunk. You know, there's no scientific justification for doing so. There's there's no evidence that it works. And in fact, it's horrifically harmful. You know, it, it kills people. Um, queer people who wind up going to conversion therapy have some of the highest rates of suicide in our community, you know, as far as any other slice of demographic. So it's an intensely dangerous thing. And I'd caution anyone who is you know, thinking of sending their children to conversion therapy. It's like, you're going to kill your kid. Very likely you could kill your kid. Um, you know, and if you, if, if, again, if you know that someone's going to send their child to conversion therapy, you know someone's considering conversion therapy, stop them, number one, from hurting themselves or hurting their child. Another thing would be to, you know, create a safe place for conversion therapy survivors to land once they've come out. Yeah. Um, report conversion therapists if you know that something like that is happening. Make sure that it's broadcasted. It's on the loudspeaker. Um, we can't ever stop the practice if we don't know who's committing such an egregious act. Is there anything else you want to add? Anything that you think is important? Um, just that if you're a conversion therapy survivor, you're not alone. There are other people out there who've experienced what you've experienced. Um, it may not be the exact same story, but people who know what it feels like to be that alone. Um, there is a community out there for you, and um, you know we're here. Well, thank you, Claire Kilman, for sharing that with us today. You're welcome. I'm happy to be here. Are we going to hug it out? Yeah, we can hug. Do you want to hug? You want to hug? Should we? Do you want to hug? hug? I'll hug you. <laughs> You still are like one of my favorite people ever. I swear. <laughs> well, thank you for uh, you know allowing me to tell my story and share that. I appreciate it. Yeah, anytime. Are you serious? Thank you for letting me do it. <laughs> I'm just like the mouth. I just like I don't even know what I do at this point. I appreciate the work that you're doing for my community in you know the realm of public health. I think it's just important. Um, it's never going to change without people like you. Uh, focusing on stories like mine.